One of Jesus' followers, the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter to a young man who had worked beside Paul in going throughout a lot of what's modern day Turkey and some in Greece and other places, traveling along with the Apostle Paul, starting churches. And one of those churches, Ephesus, the Apostle Paul left Timothy there, his, this young man that he trusted, to, to go ahead and handle some things that were going wrong in that church, and Paul needed to go somewhere else. And so part of what this letter is, as God inspired, God spoke through the Apostle Paul, even as he was writing, just like he spoke through the, the prophets in the Old Testament, he inspired Paul to write this letter to Timothy. And from it, we see, as we saw last week, how this gives instructions to how the church is supposed to be set up and how the church is to function. Let me quickly just say as a little bit of background for those of you who may not know what is going on and why there, I even said open up to the New Testament versus, well, that, if we're saying New Testament, that means there must be an Old Testament. And so let me just quickly just summarize and catch everybody up so that way when we get into this letter, we're all on the same page. So we have the, the Old Testament, which is kind of more than the, the half of the Bible, the, the backside there. And that starts with telling us the creation of all things, how God made everything in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested from his creation. And he made all the animals and all the plants and all the trees. And he made Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, they were able to be in relationship with God and walk with God and talk with God. And it was glorious and there was nothing wrong. And that sounds like a place I would like to live for sure. But God had a command and God said, you can eat and you can enjoy this place, but do not eat from this particular tree. And someone came along, as many of you would know as Satan, in the form of a, a serpent to come and to tempt her and to talk to Eve and get her to focus off of God and look at that fruit on that tree and say, huh, maybe, maybe God doesn't want good things for me. That's what she was being told. And, and so she, she believed that and she took and she ate and she also gave it to Adam and he ate. And that brought sin because that's what sin is. It's disobeying God. And that brought sin into the world and divided us, all humans, from God from that point forward. One of the great things is in that section of the Old Testament, it talks about how even though we're divided and even though we're, we're sinners and we now cannot be in the presence of God, God said, don't worry, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to send someone. There's going to be someone who's going to come. And he's going to come and he's going to, he's going to crush the head of that serpent. He's going to defeat Satan. And so be on the lookout for him. And so as you read the Old Testament and you start to see this story unfold, and there was a guy like named Noah who came along. And everyone's like, oh, maybe this is the guy. This is the guy that we've been looking for. And he wasn't exactly the guy, although part of his life pointed to the guy who was coming. And so if you're familiar with that story, God went ahead and he flooded the whole earth, except for Noah and his family. They got on the ark with the animals and God flooded the whole earth. But afterwards, God put a rainbow in the clouds to say, I'll never do that again. A little while later, a guy named Abraham comes on the scene and goes, oh, maybe this is the guy. God says, no, nah, he's not the guy yet. But from this guy's family, this guy Abraham that one that I promised, he's also going to be in Abraham's family. He's going to be in, in Abraham's son Isaac's family and, and Jacob's family. And Jacob had a son named Judah, and he's going, to, he's going to come from Judah's family too. Judah's not the guy, but, but there's going to be a guy who's coming, this promised one, and he's going to make everything right. He's going to be the lion from this tribe of Judah. And so as you continue to read, more of the prophets came and gave us more details about the one that was coming. And they said he's going, to be, he's going to be from a people and he's, and he's going to be a king. And then there's this guy, David. And oh, maybe this is the guy. And David wasn't the guy either. Maybe his son Solomon. Nope, not him either. Although they were pretty good kings. But they pointed to the still the one that would come. So now we know that he's going to come from Adam and Eve. And he's going to come from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah we're still looking for him and years are passing and more of the Old Testament's being written telling us more and more about who we're looking for. And he's going to be a king like David, but better than David. And when he sits on his throne, he'll reign forever. 
But it's not David. And then we see the rest of the Old Testament giving us more detail, more detail. And then all of a sudden, God stops sending his revelation, his, his words to the people. And they're sad because they're waiting for the promised one to come. And now they're not even hearing from God. And there's 400 years of silence. And then God speaks again. He starts to, to talk again to his people and he sends Jesus and Jesus is that promised one. And there's all these prophecies in the Old Testament. We don't even have time to be able to do it. You can go through and see. How do we know is the one that we're looking for? We, we know again that he's going to be from Eve. He's going to be from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, from the tribe of Judah. He's going to be from David's line. We get all this, but there's even more details. And you can look and see, oh my goodness, this is him. The promised one is here. And so the people were excited as they got to know Jesus. And he's doing miracles. And they're going, oh yeah, th yeah, this could be him. And they said, well, you know what? We want you to go in and we want you to take over from the bad government and we want you to be king right now and just demolish the government. Many of you would be like, amen, we need to get rid of the government. Well, that's what the people were saying at that time. God's people were saying, oh, please, 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 please come. And Jesus had to explain to them that I'm not here to do that this time. I'm here to do something different this time. See, in, in his first coming, he's, he's coming to, to, to live a perfect life that we couldn't live. See, all of us going all the way back to the fall, we're all sinners. Well, Jesus, not a sinner. And the reason that we're all sinners, check this with me now, watch this. It's not that you sin and, so thou, and now you're a sinner. It's that inherently, because of the fall and our connection to Adam and Eve, we are already sinners. And so guess what? That means we sin. If you don't believe me, come hang out my house with little Simeon. I told some of you this recently, but he's now 10 months and he's crawling. Really, Isn't it amazing how quickly they can crawl? Just gone. And so we say we have cords hanging down, of course, because we have electronics, because this is the world we live in. And we'll say, Simeon, Simeon, no cords. And he does it. I'm not joking. He goes. And he looks. <laughs> no cords. Dun, 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 dun. Gets closer. Simeon. Ten months old. He understands what's going on there. He knows. He can tell by the change in our voice. He understands what's going on, and he still goes for it. Friends, it's we that's our problem. That we are sinners and thus we sin and we're separated from God. And, but Jesus coming, being born of the Virgin, is different. Born of the Virgin Mary. Some of you've heard about the Virgin Mary. That's why that's so important. So he's born of the Virgin Mary, he lives this perfect life, and then he goes to the cross. And as he goes to the cross, like we have there, he goes to the cross and he dies on that cross in our place as a sacrifice, as we were singing about the lamb that was slain. If you go to the Old Testament, you study about the lamb and what's going on in these sacrifices. It's all pointing to Jesus, everything pointing to him. And so he's this sacrifice on our behalf, but he doesn't stay dead. We, we serve a, a living God, a living Lord and Savior. And so he dies, but three days later, he rises because he was innocent, even though he took on all of our sin. And he gives us his righteousness. It's what one theologian calls the great exchange, where he takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. So here's, here, here's, here's where we're at. He's, he's risen, he's around on the earth with his disciples for 40 days, and then he goes away, back to heaven. He's at the right hand of God right now. And one day he's coming back. Now, after he goes, Christianity... He told his followers, you need to spread this message that Jesus has come for all peoples, all tribes, all nations, just like we read about in the book of Revelation. That's going to happen. So he says, go and do this. And I'm with the Father, and one day I'm coming back. Now, why do I say that? Because that's exactly where we are in the letter to 1 Timothy. The letter to 1 Timothy is the churches are being started, and his followers are starting these churches, and so Paul is one of those followers, and he's writing this letter, and that's 1 Timothy, okay? Everyone caught up? Feel good? All right. So in 1 Timothy, we've seen in chapter 1 that the Apostle Paul wrote Timothy, and he told him, hey, there's going to be these false teachers. Be careful. Make sure you hold, you hold to the Bible. Don't listen to what they're saying. They're going to come in and tell you false things. 
And then he says that we need to be praying. Timothy, make sure that we're praying for all people. Doesn't matter their background, their ethnicity, whether they're rich, poor, their jobs, none of that matters. God died that all people would be saved. All types of peoples. Jews, Gentiles, it doesn't matter. Make sure we're praying for all of them. And then he explains how we're to function in the church, and we walk through that for a few weeks. And then he explains inside the church what the, the leadership should look like. Who are the elders in the churches or the pastors, the leaders? And then we spent a week talking about the deacons, those who serve, making sure that things, the people in the church are okay, making sure they don't have any tangible needs. And then last week we talked a little bit about the fact that the church exists to be like a, a pillar or a buttress. If you've seen a, a great building or even like these pillars right here that we have, what are those doing? They're holding something up. The church exists to hold up the truth, to hold up Jesus for the world to see. And that leads us to our sermon today. I'm going to start reading in chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, and then we're going to go into chapter 4, and that's what we'll work through as I teach, okay? So 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Great indeed, the Apostle Paul writes, we confess is the mystery of godliness. So he's saying it's it's a great thing, the mystery of how we're saved, about Jesus, this mystery. Jesus was manifested in the flesh, meaning that God became man. God took on flesh. The Son of God came. He died and he was vindicated by the Spirit. He, he rose. The Holy Spirit rose him from the dead. Angels saw him. He's been proclaimed and is still being proclaimed among the nations. The world has believed on him. Some have, some haven't. That's the decision we all have to make. And he was taken up into glory, like I said, and he's coming back one day. Now, here's our text for today. Follow me. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. We'll get to that. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Verse 4, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Verse 6, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith, and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Verse 10, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Let's walk through verse by verse and see what God is teaching us today and how it may apply to our lives. As the Apostle Paul, again, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing the Word of God here, now the Spirit, meaning God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he expressly says in verse 1, in later times some will depart from the faith. We don't know exactly where this is talking about. This could be from the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit is saying that there will be some in these later times. What are the later times? Well, remember I just told you guys that when Jesus went up to be at the right hand of God and he's coming back. Well, that time frame between when he went to be at the right hand of God and before he comes back are the later days. Guess what that means? We're in them now. Okay? We are in these times now. So the Spirit, is, the Spirit says that even in these times right now, and the times to come before Jesus returns, some will act like they're Christians and be with Christians, but they're going to swerve away from the faith. What's going to happen is they're going to devote themselves, instead of to the Bible, the Word of God, instead of following Jesus, they're going to devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. That's a very interesting language there. See, there's going to be other... Paul at this time writing says there's going to be other religions, there's going to be other ideas, other philosophies, and the way that you're going to know if they're true or not is you compare them to the Word of God. If they're different, then they're not true. And what's going to happen is people are going to start to chase after those things, and they're going to say something different. 
And as they say something different, people are going to go away from being Christians. Some will never become Christians because they're blinded by that. But notice where they, where they come from. They're not made up by men. They're made up by deceitful spirits. They're made up by teachings of demons. Now, what is a demon? Well, a demon is an angel of God. The ones that, There are those that were singing around that we read about and will sing and, and worship God. Well, there were some that fell from heaven. Satan was one of those. And so as they fell from heaven, they are demons. They're evil spirits trying to work against God, trying to work against God's people, trying to keep as many people away from the truth as possible. So they come and they develop these other ways of thinking, these other religions, these other myths, these other ideas, and say, hey, look at this. This is better over here. Trying to get people to believe something different. On your notes, go down a little bit on your notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, another letter that Paul writes, verses 13 through 15, he's talking about some false teachers who are coming and teaching these false things. But notice what he says here. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen. We're going to see that word deceitful all the time. Here's what, here's what deceit is. Some of you may, you've definitely experienced deceit. It's where you kind of say things that are true, but it's not really true. You kind of have bits and pieces of the truth, but inside, it's death inside. So a great example of this, you, many of you here have gone fishing before, you've looked out on the water and seen people fishing. There's bait on there, and that's true, and that's good, and fish, guess what? They really love that bait, and it's a good thing for them if they could just have the, the meat on there, the shrimp or something, right? That's a good thing. What's inside of the meat normally? The hook. That's the false teaching. That's the bad stuff. So what you'll notice is that with this deceitfulness, there's going to be truth, and so that's going to be times like if you study other things and you go, hey, that's kind of like the Bible. Yeah, it's kind of like the Bible, but it's different than the Bible because inside there's a hook waiting for you. And it grabs you and takes you away. And so back in the 2 Corinthians passage, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Paul's saying in this part, there's other teachers and they, they act like they're followers of Jesus, but they're not. And then it says this, look at verse 14 on the notes. And no wonder, for even Satan, the guy who tempted all the way back in the garden, right? The fallen angel who, who tempted Eve. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their need. Here's what he's saying. Even Satan would come, and if, you're, if you don't understand what's being said, he disguises himself as an angel. And so there's different ideas, different uh, beliefs, different religions that say, oh, well, ours, uh, you know, we understood this from an angel. An angel came and gave us this information. The problem is if it doesn't match up with what God's word says, then it can't be true. And it's, you might say, oh, it was an angel, but it would be a demon disguised as an angel. That's what he's warning about. And he was warning about this 2,000 years ago. And so back in our text here, he says, the, the, the people, Christians will, or people who say they're Christians, are gonna depart from the faith because they're gonna devote themselves. They're gonna get tricked by false teaching that really comes from these demons. That's where it comes from. That's where it originates from through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So the demons themselves aren't always going around speaking it. There are false teachers that are going and speaking it. And it says that their consciences, they've been seared. It's kind of like if you got a, a, a burn, it just gets hard there. There's no feeling anymore. These false teachers at Paul's time and even today are going around and they don't even care what they're saying. They don't care that they're leading people astray. They can't, they're not even sensitive to who God is. And so they just teach these false things. Paul says all that originates from Satan and demons trying to pull people away. So here's what they're doing. Here's what they're teaching, at least at the time in, in Ephesus. Watch, watch what it says, verse 3. Here's what they're doing. These false teachers are coming, being pushed by these demons, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So what they were doing at this time is they're going around and they're saying, hey, 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 if you really want to be holy, if you really want to be righteous, it's not that you have to trust in Jesus. Now, Jesus is good, but you have to do some extra stuff too. And one of the best things you could do is not get married. Now, I better not hear an amen in there. We don't want that, right? <laughs> good job. <laughs> good job out there. That's a good job. Now, saying, oh, if you stay single now, does, would, would God call somebody that? Yes, that's possible. Are there situations where people are single? Yes. And some of you desire marriage, and if that's what God has for you, we're praying that he will bring the right person. But Here's what these guys were teaching. They're saying this, oh, if you, if, you stay, if you stay single, you're extremely holy. 
See, that's going to be a good work. And good works, that's going to check all the boxes so you can go to heaven one day. Same thing with these foods. See, God in Acts chapter 10 had said, okay, yes, there was a, there was a time with his people that he said certain food they weren't supposed to eat. And the reason they weren't supposed to eat it is that they were supposed to be different than the rest of the world and they were to look different. And so part of that was how they dressed and the different things they did and things that they ate. But now that Jesus has come, it's different. And so God in Acts chapter 10 says, now all food is acceptable. So sometimes people will wonder, well, why do, why, do, why, why do like Jewish people, they don't eat pork, but Christians seem to eat pork. And even when we lived overseas, that was a common conversation. But part of it is because God after that time said, everything is now acceptable for you to eat. You can receive it with thanksgiving. But these guys come in and they're teaching this. They're saying, oh, no, 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 listen. Stay single and, and, and abstain from certain food and then you're gonna be really holy and you'll do these good works and that will save you. This Jesus guy, yeah, he's okay, but you do these things and this is what will save you. Now, why does this matter for us? Because we constantly think that if we can do some good works, maybe we'll be saved. Maybe we'll go to heaven. Maybe we won't go to hell. We're gonna talk more about that in just a moment. But that's what the Apostle Paul is pointing out to Timothy here, saying, look, this is a problem. These guys are coming in and they're teaching that, oh, if you can look like you're living this holy life, well, then maybe you might get saved in the sense of going to be with God in heaven and not to hell. And Paul's saying they're teaching false things and it's coming from demons. Verse four helps describe to us, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and by prayer. Whatever food and, and marriage itself, those are gifts from God. And so if we do those the way that the word of God says and we pray, then they are gifts and we should receive those with thankfulness. And so this is another clear teaching on that. So he moves on to verse six and he's saying, all right, Timothy, if you put these things, verse six, before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. He says this, Timothy, I've left you there to teach them. If all this stuff I'm telling you in this letter, if you put this before the church, you're doing a good job. And so this also flows to pastors today. We need to put these things before the church. And then we would be seen as a good servant. You're only a good servant if you do what your master tells you. And our master, Timothy's master, ultimately is saying you need to put this before the church. Now watch what happens here. There's a warning again that comes in verse seven. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Sometimes we look online and we find something and we begin to click and learn more and learn more and we devote ourselves to things that really don't matter that much. We start to go down these kind of rabbit holes of different beliefs and conspiracies and ideas and things of this nature and you keep going and going and going and he's saying, you need to be careful with that. Don't devote yourself to those things. Hold fast to the word of God. And look what it says. Train yourself for godliness. I've had many people come to me and tell me all about things in the Bible and different things that they've studied and how they're spiritual. And they love to get into different conversations about the end times and what do these numbers mean and what's going on over here. And guess what? The problem is they're not actually following Jesus in the first place. They're mean to people. They're in sin, but they want to debate and talk about all these different things in the Bible instead of just following the Bible. And what Paul would say is, hey, stop trying to investigate and figure out all these deep things that really don't matter and follow Jesus. Love God and love your neighbor. And so part of what they're doing is they're coming in and they're trying to get people to get their eye off of the gospel. Gospel means, congregation, what does gospel mean? The good news which we already talked about, that good news that Jesus would come to save us. And they try to get our eyes off of the good news and, and talk about all, everything else out there, and, and we fall for it, and so he's warning about that. So train yourself for godliness. Now, this idea of training here means it's going to be work. You've got to be disciplined. You need to be holding fast to God's word and prayer and asking the Spirit to, to teach you through these things. So you have to train yourself in it. Verse 8, for while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also life to come. What is he saying? Hey, it's really good to exercise. It's great to lift weights and run and all those things that some of y'all like to do. That's good. This is maybe my favorite verse in the whole Bible. That's good, 
but devote yourself to spiritual things, godliness that way, because it's beneficial now and forever. So right there, what I'm hearing, I don't know what you're hearing, what I'm hearing is, what I'm hearing is, y'all can go for a run, I'm going to sit down with coffee and read my Bible, and that's going to be better, right? <laughs> I'm getting some amen, right, amens on that. No, both are good, right? Our body's a temple given to us by God, we want to steward our, our bodies well, but don't just focus on that stuff. Spiritually, we need to be following the truth that God would make us look more like his son. And that's good now and good forever. Now, the last two verses for today. Here's what he says. The saying is trustworthy. We've seen that like a couple different times throughout this book. So there's all these sayings that are trustworthy. And I told you, I really want you guys to start getting some bumper stickers or coffee cups that have these different sayings on them, okay? Really good. So there's a new saying that was going around in the early church. It's deserving of full acceptance. We should, we should fully accept what's about to come. For to this end we toil and strive. Okay, this end. What, what is, what's the end? We've got to figure out the end. But we toil and strive. We work hard because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. The Apostle Paul writing here, and here's what he says. Let me break some of this down for you in the sentence. Number one, if you say, well, he's the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Well, if he's the Savior of all people, that means all people go to heaven. Nobody will go to hell. Nobody's separated from God. Everyone goes to heaven, Savior of all people. So, hey, what do we talk about? Let's go have a good time. Let's go do whatever it takes. That's not what the passage is saying. There are many clear teachings that it is through faith that we are saved by the grace of God. And if you accept his gift, then you are saved. If you reject it and you rely on your own works, then you are not saved. So the Apostle Paul is saying, Paul and all Christians should toil and strive what are we striving for? We want everyone to understand that Jesus is the Savior. Now, when you use the word Savior, that means you have to be saved from something. And as we talked about before, what are we being saved from? Well, you're being saved from God, by God. You're being saved from the wrath of God. Now, why would God be angry? Well, God is angry about our sin. Because he is holy and just, you, you, he has to punish our sin. At the same time, he is loving and gracious and merciful. And so what you see at when the cross, on the cross, is you see those two things come together. The mercy and justice of God being poured out on Jesus in your place for your sin, so that way he is still just and holy, but it's also his love that he would send his son for you. But we're being saved from the wrath of God, which includes hell forever. So as we're saved from the wrath of God, he's our savior, but notice he's the savior of all people. This would be all, again, going back to all types of people, all ethnicities, rich, poor, doesn't matter your job, he is the savior of all peoples. Now, I have something very special here. You didn't know this today, but we are all going to die by about 12.30 probably. <laughs> right around 12.30. This is just an example. Do not run out. 12.30. <laughs> we're all gonna die, okay? But I have this pill that will save you. If you take this pill, you will not die at 12.30. If you do not take it, you will die at 12.30, okay? <sighs> Ian, come here. <laughs> hey, bud. What some are teaching at this time is that you need to do some works and then you could be saved. So, Ian, do you think you could do two push-ups? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Y'all think you could do two push-ups? I think you do push-ups. If you will do two push-ups, I'll give you one of these. Go ahead. You'll be saved. Pretty good form there. Nice work. All right, so he would get... Perhaps this here. The problem is the moment he does that, it cancels this. And he gets a paper clip. <laughs> it's not actually going to help him, even though he tried to work. What up, babe? Would you come here real quick? Yeah, I didn't tell you you were going to do this. It's great. <laughs> I know. Come here. Kind okay. Of kind of surprise for you. Yeah. If he will come 
And I want to, now don't, don't actually eat this, but. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and he just comes and I say, in my grace and mercy, I say, hey, this is for you. You can take it. And he just receives it as a gift. You see? He just receives it as a gift. And then he were to take it, then it would save him. He's got to receive it as a gift. Okay? If you work for it, you ruin it. You get something else. You ruined it. <laughs> if, <laughs> exactly. Some were coming in as false teachers telling and that people were believing. And some were coming in saying the truth. The only way you know is you compare it to the word of God. And so what's happening here is that Paul is writing and he's saying, Jesus is the Savior for all. There, it, he, is, he is sufficient for all that would be. Guess what? I have over f- about 300 of these in here. There's more than enough for all of you. But here's what you would have to do. You would have to receive that. It's sufficient for all of you, but it will only work for those, it's only efficient for those who would come up and in their gra- and just accepting God's grace and humility and take the medicine. And by 1230, they would be okay. Or you can keep doing it like Ian's doing and keep working and guess what's going to happen? 1230, you're done. Thank you guys. Give me that. Don't take it. <laughs> Go back sit down. Thank you, Ian. You can have that. That's a gift for you. He's the savior of all kinds of peoples as we've been singing about and reading about all ethnicities, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, doesn't matter your job, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. He is the Savior of all. And his death is sufficient for all who would come and accept this message. But what we cannot do is listen to false teaching and think that in some way, maybe we could do some good works. And if we do more good than bad, we would be saved. The problem is the Bible says all of your works are actually bad. And what you need is to humble yourself and take the gift of Jesus' righteousness, being made holy, and give him your sin. And so the Apostle Paul here is explaining here that we, we, Paul and us, uh, those of you who are Christians here, we strive and we toil that we would tell all about this living God who loves them and pursued them. Think about that. God did not stay, and, and we sinned against him. He just stayed away and said, okay, well, you're just going to get it now. Every religion, everyone teaches that you have to work your way somehow to get to God. And what the Bible says is, no, God came to us. He's a living God, and he pursues us. And he wants a living, active relationship with us. And so we we toil and we strive because our hope is set on a person, Jesus, not our own works. Because believe me, I love you if you're here. Your works are filthy rags. They will not get you saved. But Jesus, his works are perfect. And he gives those to you. And so our hope is set on a person, not a place. Not, our hope isn't set on heaven. Our hope isn't set on our works. It's set in a person, Jesus, the living God, who's the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. And so that's the decision we all have to make. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your word. We're thankful for uh, this letter that you inspired, Lord, Paul, to write to Timothy so we can understand Lord, about salvation being to all people, how we can understand about what the the church is and what it means to become part of God's family and how we're to worship together and how the church is, it's the people, not even a building. Lord, we're thankful for the buildings that we can meet in and they are beautiful, Lord, but we're thankful for the church being your people and the gathering of your people. God, I pray for everyone that's here, Lord. I pray for those who are following Jesus right now that they would make it, that that they would toil and strive to make sure that others know about your grace and Lord, that we would would think about your grace and we'd hold fast to the word of God and we wouldn't we wouldn't be pulled away by the false teachings, God, that we would, we would hold quickly and strongly to your word. Lord, I pray for, for those who are here who are, are considering wh- whether or not they, they, they want to, to give their life and accept this gift of grace from God, from you, Lord. I, I pray that they would. I pray that today they would cry out in their hearts and say, Lord, I want your gift of salvation, God. Please, please forgive me for my sin. And Jesus, thank you for dying for it. Lord, for those who may be here where they're, they're still like, no, I just, I just don't think this is going to be for me, Lord, I pray that you continue to work in their hearts. And Lord, that one day you'd bring them closer to you and that they would come to faith in Jesus. Lord, we know that we cannot do this on our own, that we need you to pursue us, we need you to save us, and so we're thankful for it. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.